The Shadow Energy Minister, Ted O'Brien, has claimed that Australia could have established nuclear power industry within a decade. The Energy Minister, Chris Bowen's response? Tell him he's dreaming. Joining me now is Nationals leader, David Littleproud. David, thanks so much for your time. Let's talk nuclear because Chris Bowen has said uh, that all the examples around the rest of the world are that it takes about 19 years and there are massive time and cost blowouts. What do you say to that? Well, if Chris is so confident in his analysis, uh, then let's remove the ban and let's the market decide. Uh, let's fight this out rather than him and I screaming at my other and just let the market decide uh, how important this is and how, how capital will flow towards it. I mean, there is already people prepared to build a nuclear power plant, small-scale modular nuclear plants. Uh, I've already met one uh, that owns a metallurgical coal mine in, in central Queensland. Mm. They believe if they ran their mine off uh, SMR, they get a 14% premium for their coal uh, to export around the world. It'd pay for itself. So this wouldn't cost the Australian taxpayer a cent. So why wouldn't, if Chris Bowen's so confident in his own, his own conviction, why wouldn't he join our hand and say, let's take away the ban and let's let the market decide about the energy mix? But why also would we go down a concentrated level of putting all our energy eggs into one basket, which is what Chris Bowen's doing, putting an extra 28,000 kilometres of transmission lines? Just cast your mind back to a couple of sure. months ago when Victoria uh, lost their uh, energy source because transmission lines were blown over. The more transmission lines you have, the greater the risk of them being blown over in increased storm events. So why wouldn't we put nuclear power plants where existing coal-fired power stations are so you don't need new transmission lines? You cut down the nearly $100 billion in extra costs for the transmission lines that Chris conveniently uh, forgets to add into the analysis around renewables, nor the $20 billion in the capacity investment scheme, which underwrites a price for the renewable energy to be built. So Chris Bowen uh, is forgetting a lot of this, but I, I think people just want to have an honest debate. So I think the best way to have that honest debate is to have it in the marketplace. Sure, but your as we understand, working on putting more details towards your nuclear plan uh, with Peter Dutton, are you saying that there would be no government subsidy or no government support for your nuclear plan if you're letting the market decide? Well, it, it'd be... No, well, we already subsidise the market, uh, whether it be through the renewable schemes that we provided uh, and, and the actual subsidies that we're providing for the extra transmission lines. Now, that's getting an extra $60 billion worth of private investment, but that private investment wants a return, and that return comes through your energy bill. Uh, so what we've got to do is look at the money that's been set aside. I've just articulated over $100 billion that Chris Bowen's prepared to commit the Australian taxpayer to. Yeah. Uh, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we look at how we cut this differently? And why would we have put a concentration risk on our energy sector by putting all our energy eggs in a renewable basket yeah. when we have sovereignty of all our resources? And we're going to be honest with people. This will be where existing coal-fired power stations are. You don't need to worry about them turning up in a suburb near you. This will be meticulously planned through. Uh, we will be working through making sure communities come with us, uh, which, unfortunately, what hasn't happened with renewable projects there's been no social licence gained by these renewable projects. We're tearing up the environment, tearing up prime agricultural land, tearing up communities without any consultation whatsoever. So this will be a planned and structured process mm -hmm. where the Australian people will come with us. And I think you, you've got to say that that's the better way that, and the way that I asked Anthony Albanese cool. to come with the Nationals when I first became the leader. I asked for a National Energy Summit I mean, but, so that we could work through but, these issues. I mean, but when you look at our energy sector, the market never decides. There's always subsidies. So when you say open it up, remove the ban, let the market decide, that wouldn't be the truth either, would it? Well, well so, long as, so long as you're not isolating one source of energy from another and, you know, this government has demonised uh, carbon capture storage. They've taken away the support that we had uh, to those gas and coal companies, coal-fired power station yeah. companies, that wanted to invest in reducing emissions in their traditional industries. Okay. So you've got to have a technology agnostic approach. You've got to be fair in, in the money that you're using for Australian, of Australian mm -hmm. taxpayers' money. But you've also got to think to the future about how we get an energy mix, not have a concentrated mix, and then how we actually make sure that we get that reliability, affordability, and drive down our emissions without 
you know, having to look at end of life products uh, like wind turbines that we don't know what, what we're going to do with. They're in waste for nuclear, let yeah. me tell you, there's a, a product that Australia has created, Synrock, uh, created here about actually making the waste into a synthetic rock that's stabilised. Uh, we've already got the know-how here in Australia. Uh, why wouldn't we change the culture of this country of finding reasons why not to do things rather than saying, let's do it and we know how and let's make it happen? Well, it sounds like you'd keep the same pool of um, government support, subsidies, whichever way it is, but uh, some of it would be redirected from renewables to nuclear. Is that right? Well, and if we can, and we can spend less, even better. But yeah. why would you but put sure, but, all but would that the concentrated risk into one, into one energy source? Well, you're not going to need the 80 to $100 billion worth of, of transmission lines that this government has to spend. Well, yeah, but there's uh, always a valley money. of and, death and, here. And there's always a valley of death. And that's what, you know, has stuffed our reliability from successive governments, you'd have to say, not making good decisions. So what happens in the interim? Well, well how is it... How is it a good decision? Yeah. How is it a good decision to put all your concentration risk into one energy source, and then increasing the risk of mm -hmm. that being less reliable by having thousands of kilometres of new transmission lines that yeah. you've got to pay for? When you can cut the costs uh, and you can have a long-term, stable, reliable energy source that plugs in where existing coal-fired power stations are, yeah. uh, that transitions straight across. That's that's a common sense solution of a of a uniformed and sensible transition. Uh, to making sure that we reduce our emissions and using the sovereignty of our resources we have. That should be planned out, and that's yeah, what we've got the time to do. What's the timeline? Uh, well, we could, that's, well, that's why you should have that conversation and have the courage to lead that. Now, the Nationals have been on this for a decade, and it's taken Peter Dutton to lead the Liberals to join us on this, and, and that's why it is mm. time critical that we start this conversation and finish it now, open the marketplace up and make sure that the signals, the investment signals are sent so that capital can flow. Uh, and that yeah. is what good leadership would, would look like at a national level. But the Prime Minister uh, doesn't even have the courage of his conviction to say that it doesn't stack up by uh, taking away the ban. We could well, walk sure. into Parliament next week and fix this. Yeah, sure, but you did have a decade to do it. Um, whilst the coalition was in government, well, I, and now you're Laura, doing an opposition. I, 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 I know I you say that Peter, you, you know Peter Dutton's now with you on it, but you know for months and months you've been talking about small-scale nuclear. Then we read in the Australian newspaper last week that it would also involve large-scale. Is that true? Well, and, and this is where you look at where the market would make that investment, and, and you shouldn't you shouldn't contail a marketplace where capital wants to flow into. Uh, but what you have, do have the capacity, as I articulated earlier, where private investors can go behind the metre and actually uh, build their own SMRs uh, and not be part of the grid and, and have their own energy source, that they may also look to do that. So why wouldn't you be, as we've always said, technology agnostic? And uh, we've been very clear as nationals we've supported this and, and obviously it's taken the leadership of Peter Dutton to bring the Liberals to it, but we've come to a critical juncture where mm. this government has bought its net zero by 2050 targets mm. to 2030 and it's putting a whole lot of pressure on our energy yeah, grid certainly... but also Australians' wallets. So we're always um, tight for time here, David, so I'm conscious of interrupting you a lot today. But if I can just put, finally put this question to you, say, open the market, there are already investors that want to get involved here, just if the government got out of the way. Who are they and where are they? Because Andrew Forrest is one of the uh, richest men in Australia, is very high profile in the renewable space now, and he says it is built on a lie, this, this whole nuclear debate. Yeah, well, look, Twiggy Forest is all about self-interest, not national interest. Uh, but when you see, uh, less than six months ago in the AFR, uh, Deutsche Bank uh, made it very clear publicly that they had private investors prepared to come and behind the metre invest in nuclear energy. Uh, also, as I've said, there are coal mines in central Queensland prepared to undertake this. Uh, Robert Sir Baker, uh, who has a, a lot of experience in the energy sector, owns a coal-fired power station today, is in the Australian, mm -hmm. saying, yes, this makes sense. When you've got industry group, you've actually got the unions and you've even got the South Australian Premier saying, let's actually face mm. up to this. We're going to need it. Let's get on with it. And let's have the courage of our conviction to come forward with this. Take away the ban. 
uh, and back Australian know-how to get this up and going to give us affordable, reliable energy. And, and if I'm wrong, I'm, I've got the courage of my conviction to be proven wrong, Laura. I, I have no problems um, that if yeah, the marketplace is open up and it doesn't you might not be proved wrong float, for another 10 years and you might not be here to accept that. <laughs> but, but with all due respect, we've got, time. Career, sure. we've got time. We've got time. By popular demand, that can happen to me. <laughs> uh, but you know, we, we, you've got to be you've got to be honest about this. We've got a, mm. we've got a, an opportunity to get this right by 2050. We're not walking away from our international commitments, but we don't need this folly of bringing it all forward to 2030 because that that's why Australians are hurting and why regional Australians are bearing okay. the brunt of it at the moment. All right. Thanks so much for your time. As always, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Laura.